Welcome back, geology students. Today we are talking about plate tectonic boundaries. So we're digging more into the Earth's geosphere and learning about the boundaries that make up tectonic plates. All right, so we learned in the last lecture about continental drift and the development of the theory of plate tectonics. And so this theory, like I mentioned before, came about in the 60s and it wasn't widely accepted and taught in schools until the 90s and 2000s. Um, so this is a newer theory and it took a while to get off the ground. Um, but this talks about how the plates interact how they run into each other and they pull away from each other and they have been moving for about 3.4 billion years. So there's lots of movement that has happened across the entire history of the earth. And we are going to talk about all of those interactions today. Okay. So I also mentioned at the end of your last lecture that there are seven major lithospheric plates. So we have North America, South America, Eurasia, Africa, India, Pacific, and Antarctica. So all of these are the major plates, but there are smaller plates like the Arabian plate and the Juan de Fuca plate, the Cocos plate, the Caribbean plate, the Nazca plate. So there's a few that are minor plates that we do see. Um, a lot of those are minor because they are actually disappearing. So they are diving back down into the mantle as it were. And we'll learn about all, how all of that works here throughout this lecture. Okay, so what are tectonic plates? Like I said, they are portions of Earth's crust and they interact in a bunch of different ways. So they can be pulling apart from each other or at divergent plate boundaries. They could be pushing and colliding against each other at convergent plate boundaries, or they could just be kind of bumping into each other as they slide past at transform plate boundaries. So first let's take a look at what makes up a tectonic plate. So we call tectonic plates lithospheric plates because they are composed of lithosphere. Lithosphere is crust and uppermost solid mantle, so it's not just the crust, it's a little bit of the mantle as well, and it slides along something called the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is the upper mantle that is mechanically weak and ductile, so it's molten and it allows for movement. Okay, so what's basically happening is the lithosphere is like a cookie. And the asthenosphere is like the filling. So if you're thinking of like an Oreo cookie, if you have the filling, which would be the asthenosphere, and the cookie, which is the lithosphere, you could move that cookie or slide it along the cream filling, right? So that's kind of what's happening with these plates is the lithosphere is the cookie and the asthenosphere is the gooey frosting that's in between that is not quite liquid, but it does move, right? And so that's how these tectonic plates are moving essentially. And so like I mentioned, there's three basic types of plate boundaries. So we have divergent plate boundaries, convergent and transform. At divergent plate boundaries, the plates are pulling apart. And so what's happening here is these are driving construction of material. So if you remember from the last lecture, as things pull apart, stuff fills in that void. So as rocks are moving away from each other, mantle material is filling in that void and we're reconstructing new crust. So we call these constructive margins and they are driven by tensional stress, which is tension is pulling apart. Convergent plate boundaries are driven by compression. So they push against each other. So we have compressional stress here and they are destroying rocks. So we call them destructive margins because as they crush into each other, they are destroying rocks, returning them down to the mantle, or just crushing them and deforming them significantly. In transform plate boundaries here, we just have rocks sliding past each other. And so the plates that are sliding past are not creating or destroying anything. So we call them conservative margins, and they are driven by shear stress. And shear stress is the process of, you know, shearing something apart. So plates are sliding past each other in a shearing motion. All right, so let's take a closer look at each of the individual boundaries. So first we're gonna look at divergent plate boundaries. So this animation shows you two plates pulling apart and what's happening in the middle is magma is going to ooze out, right? So the magma is coming from the mantle, rising to the surface, and it's creating volcanic activity. 
And so the plates are moving apart. We're getting new crust forming in the middle. So this is where we get our ridges along the bottom of the ocean floor and we get a bunch of new crust. And so the way the divergent plate boundaries begin is not always underneath the ocean. So most of our plate boundaries, divergent plate boundaries are on oceanic plates, but it doesn't always start that way. So here is an example of what the beginning of a divergent plate boundary might look like. So at the beginning, we might see two plates starting to drift apart. They're pulling apart, or maybe it's a single plate drifting into two because there's two convective cells below starting to pull that plate apart. And if it's on a continent, what you're going to start to see is a little bit of thinning of that crust. So as the plates pull apart, the crust in the middle starts to get thinner and thinner. It's like pulling a Laffy Taffy apart, right? As you pull that Laffy Taffy apart, the middle of it starts to get thinner and thinner. And so that's what's happening to the crust at this point. And soon you'll start to develop a lot of cracks on the surface and what we call a rift valley. That rift valley starts to get so thin that eventually water starts to accumulate in the low area and you have an inland or linear sea start to develop. And then as the rift gets wider and wider, an entire ocean starts to open up and you see the development of something like a mid-ocean ridge. And so this is actually happening right now on Earth at the East African Rift. So the East African Rift is where two plates, the Arabian Peninsula and the Africa Plate, are pulling away from each other and the Red Sea is developing. Eventually, the Arabian Peninsula and much of Eastern Africa will be pulled apart from Africa and will be kind of like islands. This will not happen necessarily in your lifetime, but um, there is active rifting happening there and sometime in the future it will be completely split and an entire ocean will run through separating East Africa from the rest of it. Um, so you can see some of the features labeled there, the fault, which is <clears throat> all of the cracks where things are starting to pull apart. That's the rifting and then the volcano where volcanism is starting to occur, where magma is filling in that void. This also occurs actively in Iceland. So Iceland is situated right on top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge runs um, north-south through the entire Atlantic Ocean. And it happens to prop up onto land in Iceland, in the Northern Atlantic Ocean. And here we see a huge rift. So you can see the crevasse that's being created in the middle of Iceland there, as well as a lot of volcanism. There are some really cool videos that I can link <clears throat> that show some of the volcanism in Iceland. Uh, there's a couple of people that have taken drones over some of the volcanoes that have been erupting in the last month or so, which is really cool to see. Um, but yeah, so this is an example of where you can actually stand on a divergent plate boundary in Iceland or in East Africa. With convergent plate boundaries, they get a little bit more complex because we have rocks running into each other. So with rocks running into each other, there's a lot of force there, right? And so we're gonna see a lot of destruction. We're gonna see a lot of really intense earthquakes. We're gonna see volcanoes, um, a lot of mountains that are really tall start to develop. And depending on what interaction we're looking at, we're gonna see different types of things created. So we have three interactions. If they're continental, continental, which are continental plates running into continental plates, oceanic plates running into oceanic plates, or continental plates and oceanic plates running into each other. And so let's look at the first one. First one is continental continental. So here, when continental collision occurs, we have two pieces of crust that are similar in density, right? Continental crust is made up of granite, I said earlier. So when continental crust runs into each other, there's a lot of upward motion that occurs. So they run into each other and they just push upwards because they're similar in density. Eventually, one is slightly higher in density, so slightly more dense than the other, and so it slides underneath the other one just so slightly. So gravity pulls that one down into the mantle. And so what we see here are very, very high mountain ranges develop, 
and they create our highest mountains on Earth, like the Himalayas. So in a continent collision, we would have something like, here's an example of India, running into the Eurasian plate. And around 70 million years ago, India took a beeline for Eurasia, and as it collided with Eurasia, it uplifted the Himalayas. So we see the highest mountain ranges in the world from continental collision. With oceanic oceanic collision, we see two oceanic plates collide and a lot more things are occurring than just high mountain ranges. Um, so here, when they are pushing against each other, again, we have similar densities, but one will overtake the other. And so the one that is more dense will end up sinking down into the mantle. So you can see the one on the left there, that oceanic plate is subducting or diving underneath, I won't use that word just yet, is um, diving into the mantle underneath the other plate on the right. And so a lot of things are created here. So when the two plates are colliding, the one that's subducting or going underneath is kind of bending the other one back. And so when it bends it back like that, we get these really deep trenches some of the largest trenches on earth. And in that trench, stuff is being scraped. So if you can imagine like a conveyor belt at a grocery store, if you put a bunch of pieces of paper on that conveyor belt, as it dives down to come back around, all of those papers start to get stuck, right? They're not gonna keep going. They're gonna get stuck in that little slot. And that little slot is called the accretionary wedge. And that's a bunch of rocks that got stuck as the conveyor belt or the oceanic plate was trying to dive back down into the mantle. We'll also see a basin form between the trench and where we see volcanism. And so we call that a four arc, bent, uh, four arc basin, excuse me. And then you'll see some volcanic island arcs there. Those are created from hydrated material that is subducting or being pushed down into the mantle. And so that oceanic plate that's going down into the mantle and kind of diving down has a lot of hydrated materials on top of it. That hydration is coming from the water, of course, in the ocean. That hydration enters the mantle and it allows for steam to develop and more rising of magma. So magma can liquefy more, become less dense, and it can rise to the surface. When that happens, we see volcanoes created. And so one of the areas we see oceanic collision is on a trench. So this is just south of Japan, north of Australia. So the Mariana Trench is the deepest trench on Earth. There's some size comparisons for you between Mount Everest and the Mariana Trench. And then there's a black smoker there in the middle for you. The deepest point along the Mariana Trench is the Challenger Deep. So that is the deepest point on Earth in our oceans, as far as we know today. Okay, this also happens in the Aleutian Islands, which is the tail of Alaska. And the Aleutian Islands is a sequence of volcanoes that are formed from this oceanic oceanic collision. So here the Pacific plate is subducting or diving underneath the North American plate, and this is the oceanic portion of the North American plate. All right, and then the last one is oceanic continental collision. So here's where the subduction occurs. I've used that word a lot. Subduction just means that a piece of crust is returning to the mantle underneath another piece of crust. It's all subduction means. Okay, so here oceanic crust is much more dense than continental crust, so we see it dive pretty steeply down into the mantle underneath the continental crust. And again, we have an accretionary wedge there. You can see kind of the little fan look. Those are all of the materials that are scraping off the oceanic crust as it dives down. So those are the pieces of paper on the conveyor belt. And then we also see volcanoes created here from the same process. This uh, image actually gives you kind of the written out portion of that process that I was um, explaining where magma is rising due to the addition of water from the hydrated materials that are subducting, creating volcanoes. So in this scenario, we also see, because we have a really steep dive of oceanic crust beneath continental crust, we see a lot of earthquakes. 
And those earthquakes are getting deeper and deeper in this scenario because the oceanic plate is diving a lot deeper. And so the Wad Wadati Benioff zone, excuse me, um, is the zone of earthquakes along the subducting oceanic crust where earthquakes are occurring and generating a lot of shaking at the surface. And so the deeper the origin of these earthquakes, the stronger they are. So when we look at some of those blue dots there, that swarm of earthquakes on the surface are going to be a lot stronger than the ones that are at closer to the surface, like the red ones there. And so um, this is known as the Benioff zone, and it was coined by these two gentlemen here. All right, so where do we see this? We see this in the Cascades. And the Cascades covers both California, Oregon, and Washington. I have a few volcanoes listed here for you for reference. Um, in California, we have Mount Shasta and Mount Lassen that are part of this sequence. And then in Washington, they have Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, they have Mount Rainier. They have a lot of volcanoes up there. Um, and so these are just a few of them in the Cascades. All right, and then finally, we get to transform plate boundaries. Transform plate boundaries are when tectonic plates are just bumbling into each other. So they're just bumping shoulders, basically. And so what's happening here is a shear motion. And those rocks just kind of crumble in the middle as they slide past each other. There's nothing created or destroyed here except for offset on the surface. And so what we tend to see is a lot of either um, man-made things or streams, things like that, that can be offset. And what I mean by offset is they're no longer lined up, right? So they are offset in some manner and they no longer line up with each other. And so uh, this happens in California, most notably the San Andreas Fault. So the San Andreas Fault is separating the North American plate from the Pacific plate. This shows you their relative motion to each other. And right where they are sliding past, we see a lot of crumbling of crust. And so you can kind of see some very low mountains there. And that is on the left, the traverse of the San Andreas Fault through um, the central portion of the coast ranges. And so this also shows you where the fault is locked and where it's creeping. The locked areas are problematic because as soon as they shift, we see a lot of really intense earthquakes. Um, where it's creeping, it's releasing that energy little by little, and we'll dive more into that when we talk about faults. We are not unique though. It also happens in Turkey. Um, this made national news uh, this year, last year. Um, and it was a big problem because they had a 7.6, 7.8 earthquake that nobody was prepared for. Um, we knew about the fault system, the North Anatolian Fault, in which it happened. Uh, but Turkey is not as well prepared as California or even Japan, for example, for an earthquake of that magnitude. Their infrastructure is not as sound. Their engineers are not as well equipped to handle what an earthquake of that size or that magnitude would do to the buildings. Um, so there was a lot of devastation and it just kind of shows you how intense these fault motions from the plate tectonics can occur. All right, so how do we know where the plates are? I showed you some images of the plates and kind of their outlines. We know this from the seismic network. So this shows you the world seismic network. All of those little dots are different earthquakes that have occurred on Earth. And then there's an overlay there of the outline of the plates. So we know where the plates are because we know where the earthquakes are. <laughs> so that's really as simple as it is. Um, we have recorded where these different earthquakes are. So then based on the swarm, we can see kind of an outline of where the plates are roughly um, because the earthquakes are happening where the plates are interacting. Didn't mean for that to rhyme. All right, so if we do look at the Pacific plate specifically, you see a lot of activity around the border, but there is some activity in the middle. So these are volcanoes that we were just looking at earthquakes. Now we're looking at volcanoes around the Pacific plate and um, we see a couple of them in the center of the plate. 
Well, if I told you that volcanoes are coming from the pouring apart or the subduction, what are the ones that are right in the center of a plate doing? Well, we call those hotspots. So these are the Hawaiian hotspots. And it's a hotspot volcano that is actively erupting pretty much every day. Um, and it helps us preserve plate motion and make inferences about what is happening. So the way that hotspots work is hotspots are stationary. They do not move, but the plate does. So what happens is a hotspot develops and it starts popping out material. So mantle material starts coming to the surface and erupting creating a bunch of rocks, that lava that comes out over time builds up and creates an island above the surface. Well, then the plate decides it wants to move and it takes that island with it. But the hot spot's still way over here in the original location. So then it starts popping out more material and creating another island. Then the plate moves and takes that island with it. And so you can look at a chain of islands and get an idea of which direction a plate is moving. And so most of the islands in Hawaii and the Emperor Seamount, which is the northern region, are oriented sort of in a north, northwest, southeast direction, with the exception of the northern region. So if we look at the northern region, just past kind of this central point, you can see there's a bend, right? So there's a bend in these islands. Why do you think there's a bend? So there's a bend because there's a change in the plate motion direction. So if the plate motion was just north, they would all be oriented north-south. If the plate motion direction was northwest, they would all be oriented northwest. But right there where the bend is, there is a change from a northern direction to a northwestern direction. Right. So there was a shift in plate motion somewhere around 42, 43 million years ago in the Hawaiian and Emperor Seamount chain. And so the hot spot now is at Hawaii, the South Island, the big island of Hawaii. Um, but all of these islands were created from that same hot spot and used to be in the position, the um, Latin long position of the big island is where all of these originated and then were pushed north and northwest while the Pacific plate moved. And so the reason that it shifts in directions is probably because it ran into another plate that was stronger and forced it in another direction. And so because Earth is dynamic, we don't have this black and white, this one's pulling apart and this one's pushing together. There's a lot of different things happening and where some rocks will pull apart other rocks will fall, will slide into each other or collide into each other. Some will just kind of drift on past. And so all of these different pieces are fitting together and running into each other in different fashions. And so it's not just this black and white, there's divergent, convergent, transform, right? So different portions of plates will be running into each other in different fashions. Um, so while this is a good Kind of just generalization, this divergent convergent transform. Um, that's not really um, how it works exactly because we have much more combo, right? The Pacific plate is in a transform plate boundary in California, but in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, it's at a convergent plate boundary. And then in other areas, it is a divergent plate boundary from another plate. So it's not one or the other. There's usually a combination of all three. All right, so once again, make sure you did the continental drift lecture, this plate tectonic boundary lecture, and then complete your lab and discussion post for the week. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.